Next, I'd like to welcome a panel who will expand further on the question of ethics, technology, dignity and respect. The panel will take questions in a short Q&A following their discussions, so do send in your questions using the app. To moderate this panel, we have professor at Harvard Law School and director of the Berkman Klein Center, Urs Gasser, who has previously highlighted the information asymmetries between the small number of people from private companies who understand the technology that affects the large number of people and the difficulties faced by the regulators and policymakers. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Urs Gasser and the panel. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good, excellent. I'm really delighted to um, moderate this panel. We have about 50 minutes um, to give you a sense of our time, also to give a sense of time to our panelists. So we have to be short and crisp. Um, I think this panel uh, really nicely builds up on the excellent keynote by Anita Allen um, and takes some sort of a deep dive looking more closely at the question, where are social norms, ethical norms coming from? How do they emerge vis-a-vis -vis new technologies? Or how are they designed, as Sir Tim uh, put it? So uh, we'll look at, at these questions and, and uh, also try to approximate it from different perspectives. So what's the role of the public? Uh, we've heard today that many of the big societal questions that we are confronted with involve all of us, uh, all stakeholders. But we also zoom in and look at the specific role of experts and communities of practice. Uh, we also talk about what's the role and responsibility of the creators of um, these technologies. Now, we are approaching these topics, these questions, by actually taking two steps back. By not looking so much at digital technology, but looking at previous cycles of technological innovation. So it's a little bit of pattern recognition. What can we learn from the past and how would it possibly translate to the future as we are now uh, faced with big uh, questions around ethics um, of AI and IoT and uh, virtual reality and quantum computing and whatever um, the buzzwords of the day are. So I'm really delighted to have such a fantastic um, uh, panel here. Um, we have uh, Tim Caulfield, Effie Vajana, we have Pascal Fung and Norman uh, Sade. We, you have the bios, so I won't go through the bios, um, but we will hear more about their work as we go forward. And the panel is structured as follows. I will start with a few questions, then followed by introduction remarks by my colleagues. Uh, we'll then hopefully have a little bit of a discussion uh, and we'll definitely open up for uh, Q&A, so I encourage you to submit uh, your questions. So, Tim, you're a professor of law. You have uh, spent a great deal of your work in looking into um, health law and policy. You followed uh, particularly public debates uh, around uh, biomedicine and bioethics. Um, you, you have uh, tracked uh, dynamics at play uh, when it comes to topics such as stem cell research. And I was wondering, um, looking at these earlier debates um, uh, in, in different disciplines that what we're talking about um, during this conference, what can we learn from especially um, the public debates uh, uh, on, on ethical issues. What are some of the dynamics at play that we want to keep in mind as we enter the age of AI? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, great, a great way to start the discussion because we're, we're supposed to be talking about ethics, right? Uh, we're supposed to be talking about the role of ethics in shaping these policies, but so often, so often, it's not about ethics. You know, ethics isn't framing the discussion. We may call it ethics, but it's, it's, it's really something else. It's, it's hype about both benefits and risks. It's technological imperative. Uh, and it's pop culture. All of these things can have a tremendous impact on the kinds of discussions that the public has and also policymakers have. have. Uh, you know, it's not about sort of the, the kind of stuff Anita was talking about, right? These foundational principles. And it's not about evidence. It's about this stuff. And I want to give one example, and you touched on it in, in the introduction. 
and that's stem cells, right? What a controversial area of science. I mean, you could make an argument it's one of the most controversial that we've faced in the last few decades. Uh, and in Canada, we developed our stem cell policy law right at the height of the social controversy, right? Right, right at the height of it, right? So we had uh, cloning laws, uh, cloning concerns. You know, this was the discussions around things like cloned armies and, and that we're going to have baby farms and the idea that we were going to be using cloning technology inappropriately. So all of this was happening right when Canada was crafting their federal law between 1998 and 2002. Um, and as a result of that, as, and we, we researched this at our institute, as a result of that, that noise, right, Canada ended up with a fairly restrictive, relatively restrictive law, right? In, and in Canada right now, it's a criminal offense to do any form of somatic cell nuclear transfer. It's a criminal offense to do many kinds of, of gene therapies, any gene therapy that would result in a germline alteration. It's a criminal offense to create an embryo for research purposes. And, and this is in Canada, which is a relatively progressive country, you would think. Contrast those policies with what happened in the UK, right? Uh, where all of those things are allowed. So, so think about this. Think, we have this really strange situation where you have two culturally similar countries, um, Canada and the United Kingdom. In one of those countries, you can get government grants to do this activity, right? You are encouraged to do these activities. There are world-leading researchers doing these activities. In Canada, you'd go to jail for the exact same thing. So this, this is a wonderful example of how what I would think, what I would call sort of you know, cultural noise around a topic can lead to less than ideal policy making that you're going to be stuck with, right? That it's going to have an impact on how, how a technology unfolds. And of course, I could use other examples, you know, the, as I said in the beginning, the technological imperative, um, and pop culture more, more broadly. One of the areas that I do a lot of research is genetics and, gene uh, and, and genetic discrimination. And the movie Gattaca continues to be a touchstone uh, topic point. A movie, right? So this goes back to what we heard about, uh, about storytelling in the very first presentation. I think that is also really important. So I'll, I'll end by saying this is really, really a call for uh, what's happening at this event, a, a careful reflection on, on ethics, the role of ethics in policy making, and how we can develop policies that are going to have enduring relevance. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a great opening and stage setter, and um, we'll hopefully get back to this theme, who's responsible for what, and how do we facilitate, uh, facilitate uh, these hard conversations around what's right and what is wrong. Um, and of course, uh, one answer in a way, and that's uh, oversimplifying what you said, uh, ethics, the norms of ethics, is coming from Hollywood. So, uh, <laughs> partly, right? Um, but of course, uh, there are also other stakeholders. It's uh, not only about this messy public conversation that is shaped in many complicated ways, as you put it. Uh, there are also experts at work. Um, there are communities of practice at work that are very influential. And I think uh, Sir Tim pointed it out, as well as, as Anita in her uh, keynote, the role uh, of, of the profession. Now, Effie Vajena, you're a professor at ETH Zurich, where you run a um, uh, health ethics and policy uh, lab and you have uh, done a lot of work actually looking at, at um, uh, communities of practice and how they agree uh, or agree over time on certain norms and instruments uh, like informed consent to just give an example in, in biomedicine and in bio, bioethics and I was wondering whether you could could supplement the story uh, we, we've just heard from, from Timothy more from that perspective. What, what drives uh, the creation of, of ethical norms? Uh, how fluid are these norms? How they may evolve over time? Absolutely. Um, building on, on teams, I will narrow into that the particular uh, example, I think, uh, that it's quite illustrative of, of how this norm formation is taking place. And when we talk about norms, it's important to think not only how they are formed, but also their nature, 
um, their characteristics and also often their universality, something that Annette Allen uh, also mentioned. So take the example of informed consent that you mentioned in biomedical research. Now for us today, that's a given. It's, an, it's a standard that we all adhere to or we hope we adhere to. Um, 60 years ago, that was not a norm. That was not a standard that was anywhere to be seen. When the Nazi atrocities came to an end, we had the Nuremberg Code that for first time there, at least put out in this, in this um, kind of presentation, the requirement of informed consent when people are asked to participate or before they were forced in uh, scientific research. Now you could say, well, that is an extreme environment. You're talking about the Nazi times, the experiments they did with those people. But even after the Nuremberg Code, you had a lot of scientific experimentation going on in our hospitals in Europe, in the US and other places where this norm was not to be seen. People would experiment, not having sinister um, intentions, but thinking they're doing a good thing. They're thinking that they're trying to improve scientific knowledge. And so what happened later, um, the World Medical Association, which is the professionals, came together and produced that declaration of Helsinki, which I think it is known to a lot of people, uh, and it had a huge impact on how a lot of things happened uh, in, in, in medical uh, experimentation, but particularly that idea of consent, it was highlighted, it was, it was put forward, and it became also part of this moral code around practitioners. Practitioners were sharing this moral obligation. Um, that particular declaration is quite interesting for many reasons. Um, it, was, it came out in 1964, it has been revised several times. And apart from the consent, it also told us something else. Well, it's one thing to ask people to be responsible by asking those experiment to ask for it. We need something more. We need an independent review. We need a body that could look at it, who could look at the study you want to do and say whether it's something to go on or not. So again, that body and that declaration gave us another way of trying to um, respect essentially at the norm of autonomy. And I'm not thinking of ethics review bodies, or IRBs as we call them in the US, as a process. It was not about just process. Behind that seeming process, it is the, the value and it is the idea of oversight that somebody has, that we need to be accountable, that we need to, to enforce those protections. So these were soft norms for a very long time. The ethics review committees became part of legal provisions a lot later uh, in, in, in our history. And one of the things I think those committees um, did was not only it was to secure, the, uh, for example, the existence of consent, but also to make a judgment, uh, a call on whether this research that was going to be conducted would have the benefits and risks and what would be the ratio of those in order to allow people to participate. Now, one thing I want to note quickly is that um, you can maybe think, okay, we set, we set the question of consent and ethics review committees and scientific research, and we're done. Well, the thing is, we are not, we're not done. We've been debating this within our communities of practice. We again for a long time. What is a good consent? Does it suffice? Do we need more things around it in order to achieve what it means to give consent? Not because we just ticked the box that we have consent. And that shows us that these norms, they're formed, but they are not static. We continue improving the norm and adjusting them. And I think that's another lesson we can learn from mm. our, for our digital, uh, the debate on the digital, is we have a lot of norms. We have a body of, for, of norms and, and, and shared values. We need to find the way that can be expressed efficiently and can be implemented in, in mm. this course. I think these are a couple of lessons that we can draw from, uh, from, uh, from bioethics. Thank you. So ethics as a work in progress in, in it some is ways. Working, yeah. Yes, it is a Great. moral project. So I would like to shift from, from that actually uh, over to Pascal Fung, who's a professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and just arrived from Hong Kong. How brave are you uh, uh, with all the chat lag? Thanks, Thanks for being here. Um, so we've heard a little bit about areas where ethical norms have crystallized over the past few decades. Uh, FE pointed towards 
rather sophisticated instruments in our toolbox in other disciplines like health, um, how we deal with some of these uh, hard ethical questions, addressing some of the uh, trade-offs and tensions that um, Sir Tim also mentioned across values. Now, you're an engineer. You're involved in building today's and tomorrow's, may I say, uh, technologies, AI in particular. Um, looking at some sort of the, from the creator side of someone uh, who's part of a community designing next generation technologies, how does that relate and contrast to the level of sophistication that, that Effie and, and Tim alluded to? Uh, where do we stand? What are the choices you're making and what are the ethical implications of your choices um, then for, for users adopting these technologies? That's a very profound question. And um, so I would like to talk about first the uh, ethical uh, practices in our fields. So um, I've worked and done research in Asia, in Europe, and also in the United States. And I worked in Bell Labs in the 19, um, early 1990s. And uh, uh, contrary to a lot of people think that we never talk about ethics in the engineering community and the research community, there are some ethical principles that are sacred to us. Uh, namely academic integrity and academic freedom. So academic research, um, technology research in our fields are considered a form of hard science. So for the longest time we believe what we do is independent of any uh, subjective values and cultural uh, standards. So we've always held dear to us the uh, freedom to create whatever we want based on scientific principles. We've always believed that as long as we do things in a scientific method, um, we can evaluate and show empirically what we have done is um, provable and so on, then we are in the clear, all right? So all we need to take care about uh, is that our work is uh, scientifically sound. So uh, based on, you know, because of that background, uh, all the work we've been doing uh, in all these decades has been subject to uh, peer review as other in other scientific fields. So as long as our peers approve of what we do, we feel that we're okay. And there are ethical uh, standards and guidelines in the professional societies, such as the Institute of Le Electrical and Electronic Engineers and the Association of Computer Machinery, um, there are ethical uh, standards governing uh, against plagiarism, for example. That's about the most, uh, um, the biggest concern we've always had about uh, our work, which is plagiarism. Okay, stealing other people's idea without citation, you know. So, because we believe what we do is so objective, we have never been, uh, g we have never given much thought to the, uh, what I call societal impact and the human impact of what we do. Um, and combined with the fact that a lot of um, technology in AI was invented uh, and funded by um, defense and security, national security agencies, um, we've always lived in sort of a bubble, believing what we do is, uh, uh, is um, uh, pure in a way. But today, with the rapid adoption of AI in the, uh, in the marketplace and with uh, its direct impact on our lives and daily lives, uh, we can no longer fool ourselves into thinking that what we do doesn't matter in that way, that we can just continue innovate to our heart's content and we don't have to worry about uh, what like medical doctors have to worry about. Uh, which is our responsibility, direct responsibility towards the society. So um, in recent years, there have been sort of a wake-up call to the whole community of uh, AI researchers that we do need to take care of um, a, a sort of uh, um, ethics, ethical framework because we're being challenged and questioned and because there has been uh, high, highly publicized cases of AI systems going rogue without our intention, without the intention of original designers. So recently we've had um, organizations formed such as the Partnership on AI by the AI technologists, the top um, AI companies in the United States were the founding 
uh, partners of this organization, but more recently, many um, in, in Europe and Asia have joined this effort. And I think a few days ago, we heard the announcement that the, um, the top Chinese search engine giant, search engine giant uh, Baidu has joined the partnership on AI to work on the ethical principles and governance of AI. So what we are looking at, though, because we're engineers, are um, engineering uh, methods and scientific methods to actually ensure verifiable, provable, quantifiable measures of a uh, of values of our, the systems we build. How can we uh, check that an AI system is in fact safe, and in fact secure, in fact doing what it's supposed to do, as opposed to, as opposed to doing things that consumers or users of these systems are not aware of? That is very important. Uh, however, we still think it's very important to have a, uh, uh, the, uh, the freedom to innovate. So if we want to have regulations on um, AI innovation, we, mu we must be, number one, mindful of um, the fact that it can impact people's lives directly every day. But number two, what are the actual software engineering principles? What are the actual um, standards, uh, ISO standards? And what are the actual um, uh, testing assessments we need to have on AI products and technology? These are the questions we're asking ourselves and working actively together um, towards uh, implementing. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. This is super helpful. And I'm particularly grateful also to have an Asian perspective in, in this debate here today. Norman, you're um, teaching at Carnegie Mellon. You're a professor. Uh, you've done a lot of work on security and privacy. And it's almost now the switch from Pascal to you from like input ethics to output ethics, right? Part of your research is actually looking at what's happening when users are confronted with technologies um, where choices have been made by their creators and uh, what are some of the consequences there and some of the uh, ethical issues that may arise, some of them unanticipated as Sir Tim mentioned in his keynote. What can we learn from, from your work, from behavioral um, uh, economics in particular, as we think through some of these hard ethical um, challenges and, and also possible solutions? Sure. Uh, so if you look at uh, privacy regulation over the past uh, few decades, it's clear that the emphasis, for good reasons, has been on transparency and giving people more meaningful uh, control over their information, more meaningful choices. And there's no question that we're much better off since May 25th of this year. At the same time, if you want uh, these regulations to generate their full benefits, you will need to also overcome fundamental uh, limitations, cognitive and behavioral limitations that we humans have, right? Privacy is known uh, to be a secondary task. That means that most of the time when we have to make privacy decisions, we're actually engaged in another task, a primary task, be it to check uh, the news online, to download your favorite uh, mobile game on your smartphone. And uh, we've been shown, uh, through a, as a result of evolution, to have these biases that will lead us to often, in these contexts, discount long-term, ill-defined, ill-understood consequences and favor short-term benefits, such as having the mobile game running on your cell phone. And because of this, uh, many of us, except perhaps people in this room, don't read privacy policies. Uh, because of this, uh, many people just don't engage with the privacy settings that are available to them. And there are many more of these settings becoming available thanks to some of the regulations that have been passed uh, recently. Uh, but the limitations I'm talking about are not just limited to user, user burden issues. Uh, privacy decisions are very easy to manipulate, as it turns out. Right? If you ask a user to grant access to his or her location to a mobile app for the purpose of offering him or her better tailored services, many of these users will say yes. If you tell the user that you would like his or her location because you're planning to mine it, and get a deeper understanding of his or her whereabouts, lifestyle, uh, if you plan to sell this information to others, you might get a very uh, different answer. So how you word these questions can also have a very big impact. And uh, we are very vulnerable uh, to, these, to these limitations, as it turns out. So my group at Carnegie Mellon has been working on technology to try to overcome these limitations, effectively to assist users in making better informed 
uh, decisions. And so those techniques range, and I'm going to be very brief here, from what we call privacy nudges, for instance. These are interventions designed to motivate users to make the right decisions, to pay attention to some information that's provided to them, as well as AI techniques, as it turns out. For instance, we've developed AI techniques to read the text of privacy policies and to try to build models of what users would probably want to know in these privacy policies. Right? What are the things that are likely to surprise them? What are the things that they are more likely to object to? Uh, we've developed techniques to also support query answering based on the text of privacy policies. So those are the kinds of things that we are working on. There are deep uh, ethical issues as you develop uh, these uh, solutions, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, so we've been able to configure many of these solutions quite successfully. Uh, an example is in a case of mobile apps, for instance, where we played with nudges. Once a day would pop up an intervention that would tell the user something along the lines of, did you know that your location has been shared 5,398 times with the following 25 apps? Would you like to check your settings? Well, guess what? This is very effective. And you find that users do engage more with their settings as a result of that. And they're less likely to be surprised, less likely to regret things. So the same is true for helping people configure uh, their settings, uh, providing them with recommendations, not necessarily making those changes for them. We're not about taking autonomy away from users, but at least assisting them so that they can more effectively make those types of decisions. So the question, obviously, is how do you evaluate these technologies? right? Is the user, at the end of the day, better off with these technologies, or is the user worse off? And there are many different ways of configuring these techniques. And so we've developed methodologies to evaluate how users stand if you give them these technologies and look at different configurations of these technologies. So I'm talking about human subject studies. That's the only way to go about doing this. Right? So you give people the technology you've developed, potentially different configurations. You also look at people who don't have the benefit of this technology. So Perhaps after a week or two, you observe people. Uh, if, uh, for instance, something bad happened to them, like their location was shared in a context that they don't feel comfortable with, and you had a recommendation for them that you didn't show them because a different group of users got the benefit of that technology, you didn't show them a recommendation to modify that setting, then clearly that user is not better off. The user who got the recommendation is better off. So you can actually measure uh, these things. It requires, obviously, very careful experimentation. But that's an example of what we've been doing in our work. There's a second line, a second issue that I'll mention, then I'll, I'll stop because I'm going to run out of time. But uh, we're working on what we call privacy assistance. So all these technologies are basically being uh, embedded and implemented in the form of what we call privacy assistance. And these assistants are intended to help you make better privacy decisions, as I said, making recommendations, nudging you by telling you things that perhaps you didn't notice, you were not aware of, uh, and, and so on. And so one of the fundamental questions uh, that uh, we have to look at as we deploy these technologies is should, who should be responsible for deploying these technologies? Should it be the technology provider or should it be a third party? And there are arguments for both, as it turns out. Right? So you could say, well, the technology provider uh, you know, knows best what they're doing, so perhaps they should be the ones actually uh, you know, highlighting uh, certain types of practices to users. Right. Uh, Facebook, uh, surprisingly enough, is a company that has actually adopted some of our uh, uh, privacy nudging uh, technology to very good effect. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's easy to see that many of these organizations might have conflicts of interest. They might start manipulating uh, the way in which they disclose information. And uh, beyond that, if you sort of think about other uh, entities than Facebook and Google and the very big uh, tech companies. If you think about the smaller players, we've seen already over the years that many of those lack the sophistication to actually develop these types of technologies. Many of them already struggle just writing a privacy policy. That's not going to get them in trouble. And so there's also a very strong argument for saying, perhaps we need third parties to actually develop these assistants in the form of browser plugins, in the form of mobile app privacy assistance, and so on. And that's only a path that we've been pursuing, and one that we believe ultimately could place people in a better position and enable them to gain the full benefits of these regulations that we've been passing over the past uh, couple of decades. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, it also highlights somehow the contextuality of the different choices, design choices that have to be made. Um, and I'm also kind of impressed that you started uh, with a very practical example, privacy not just, but by, uh, by starting with a concrete example, you took us to the meta level of the question, what, hap what are the ethical implications, the second order implications as we try to develop tools that address first order ethical 
uh, dilemma. So uh, it's an infinite regress of ethical problems. Um, which uh, actually leads me to a question for discussion for the panel and also uh, incorporating some of the questions uh, you've submitted. Uh, one uh, theme that emerges is it's messy. Ethics is messy. It will not be easy, and it is not easy to arrive at, um, at ethical norms that we can all agree upon as a community of practice or as a, a nation, um, as the people. And so the question that came from the audience uh, is really both about the contextuality of ethics as well as um, the question whether there is a universal global ethics that uh, we could envision. Um, Tim, you, you, in your remarks, you, you also highlighted the difference between Canada and the UK in terms of an outcome in one specific area. How do you think about, and these are countries that are not completely, you know, different cultures arguably, um, how do you think about this question of universality of ethics? And, and Anita in her keynote made also reference to it. Is that a possibility to have a world ethics on, on digital technology? So, I, I mean, I think it's really going to, I'm sure everyone agrees, it's going to depend so much on the topic that you're covering, right? Get, there's, some, there's some topics uh, that engage ethics that, where there are a plurality of views where you're never going to be able to have this. But I, I think in this sphere, I, I think there are fundamental principles that have been embraced almost universally. In addition to that, I think we are starting to see, and I think partly because of what's come out of the Human Genome Project discussions and the stem cell discussions, you're starting to see this international dialogue happen in a much more constructive manner. And, and I'll use the gene editing debates that we have, have seen out of CRISPR. They're not perfect, but I think they have moved us forward where you're starting to see a world consensus emerge um, yes, there's still dissenting, but you see that kind of process, an ethical process, lead to, I think, a more constructive discussion that we've seen in the past. And I think meetings like this are built on that, that kind of approach. I, I don't know if you guys would agree. Norman, please. I, I would certainly agree with, with that statement. I think that uh, we're just at the beginning in, in many ways, right? Uh, but there are clearly general principles uh, that can be identified and that will need to be refined over time. I think that we need to train more people to start thinking about these principles. So uh, at Carnegie Mellon, we have a privacy engineering program that, that I uh, started about five years ago. And uh, you know, when you look at principles, for instance, like data minimization, it, it's not black and white. You need to train people to think about these things. And each context, each solution will bring about different sets of issues and different sets of trade-offs. And I think ethics is sort of, you know, taking this same idea but bringing it to the next level is obviously much broader. And it really requires training people to think correctly about these issues. So I think there's a lot in terms of just training, not just lawyers, but also technologists, so that they can recognize these issues, they can appreciate them, they can identify methodologies to inform the decisions they're going to make as they design their, their solutions. If you want to build up on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I agree in principle uh, and also with what Tim said. Just about the training, though, I think it is one thing to train people. Um, it is another thing to provide the opportunities to debate also their differences. Um, in, in building global consensus or, for example, on things like controversial things like stem cells or CRISPR, uh, genetic editing, I think what we've seen happening, and, and I think it's laudable, is we provide opportunity for people to see where they differ in their ethical assessment. So if we were to build a global consensus, a consensus on something, we need these kinds of opportunities, this kind of fora where this can happen. One thing perhaps to learn from the debates in our field, for, for, long, for a long time, we were not including in our conversations patients. Although anything we were talking about, it was actually to protect patients or to act in their best interests. It took us a long time to bring them all that on the table and listen to what their issues are, what are the ethical challenges they have. So if we were to go for anything global, I think we need two things. The opportunity, of course, train people, but also the opportunities where they can interact and debate their differences, but also inclusion of all the actors. Our case was patients, but here were all of us, consumers, the different kinds of publics. 
Thank you. Pascal, if I may introduce another question to you that is related, uh, okay. if you don't mind. Um, uh, also coming from the audience. Um, okay, this sounds pretty optimistic that somehow there is a there. We may actually work collectively through different approaches, including education and training um, towards kind of a, a rough consensus um, globally what, what ethical behavior is. Now, at the same time, there's also the reality looking right now at what's happening in the AI space, that there are um, geopolitical interests uh, at stake, that we see an arms race uh, who's developing the best technology. Uh, there are, you know, it's a politi um, uh, a political economy within, within countries and across countries. How realistic is it? You've worked in, in many different countries. How, what's your read? Uh, this more optimistic uh, version of, you know, kind of a shared set of values. But then on the other hand, uh, we have very different competing interests. How do we bring that together? Uh, it's uh, also motivated by uh, a question from the audience. Well, that's um, something that we ask ourselves every day, isn't it? Um, so I have seen, uh, I've participated in a lot of these ethics discussions about AI technology. And uh, I have reminded a lot of people that a lot of what we talked about as ethical principles. I went to school in the um, United States and Europe and Japan. and So uh, I would say that a lot of things that we take for granted are not, in fact, universal, as universal as, uh, as we would like to believe it. And uh, therefore, uh, we really need a uh, international dialogue. That's why uh, I mentioned the organizations such as Partnership on AI. And, and when I uh, participated in a meeting last year, and I say we really need to bring the Chinese in um, because it's, you know, it's, it's not um, beneficial if we just talk about these principles from one perspective, which is the um, uh, perspective of European philosophy. And um, so uh, we are very, I think everybody's aware of some differences between uh, cultures in terms of ethical discussions. On the other hand, I'm also um, optimistic as an engineer. Why? For example, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the governance of uh, engineering practices is in fact quite internationalized and quite universal. So we all agree on a set of uh, peer review principles and how we should conduct ourselves and publish our research. And we're all being held to the same standard internationally. And in fact, we mostly publish, all of us publish in English, right? So, um, so there is some kind of um, um, a global standard of how we conduct ourselves professionally today. Um, for better or worse, but it helps in terms of uh, how we collaborate and how we evaluate uh, each other's work and how we um, um, you know, standardize, so how we, how we assess uh, the performance of what we do and also individual researchers. So that is actually existing infrastructure already to govern uh, our work professionally. So I am hopeful that within that structure, because we're already so used to uh, doing work internationally, publishing internationally, that we are also open to an international debate and the design of this ethical framework to govern what we do. So uh, when I mentioned professional societies and the standards uh, bodies such as ISO, IEEE and all that, these are I existing infrastructure. And I think um, these are uh, to, to, to build a, a further the ethical governance, uh, the governance of AI ethics on top of that in infrastructure. I think it's, it's quite uh, possible. And I'm quite optimistic that we can, uh, at, we can reach some kind of consensus. I like it. This is yes. an optimistic panel. That doesn't happen very often these days. Um, we are approaching already the end, uh, unfortunately, of, of this panel conversation. So uh, please allow me to, to ask a final question uh, with a tweet length answer from each of you, if I may. Um, so there's optimism. Uh, we identified the need for more dialogue. Uh, we emphasize this is a learning process, something we can learn from past cycles of tech innovation. We emphasize the role of education, the role of universities, frankly, some sort of public interest oriented um, 
organizations. We could talk much more about, of course, also the role of, of the government and state, something we only touched upon. But it seems there's a lot of work ahead, uh, isn't it? And, uh, and I'm wondering to get a prediction, an estimate, looking at these past cycles uh, of learning and societies coping with change, um, and as Anita uh, pointed out in her, in her Kiro keynote, that m uh, moral reasoning has a hard time to catch up with all the change we see. How long um, will it take us to um, sort out the ethics of, of privacy? What's, what's your prediction? Well, is I, it a I, decade? I, is it a few so years? I, I think it's a journey, it's not a destination, right? So uh, technologies will continue to change. Uh, at, uh, in, in ways that are very hard to probably fathom. I think someone earlier today was talking about how much faster technology tends to evolve in the long term than, than uh, what most of us would, would probably predict. Uh, that's, so that's already the end of the tweet, I'm sorry. To okay, say. Right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my answer then. <laughs> so I think um, technology continues to evolve, for sure. Um, but the need for uh, governance and ethical con consideration is very, very pressing. Because today, from the cycle from research uh, results in the labs to uh, actually being, you know, impacting people's lives and people using it, it has been shortened. I used, it used to be like 10, 20 years before you see something uh, being used by people. Um, but today it's sometimes six months, sometimes only three months from publications to actual implementation and application. So, um, so we are trying to play catch up. Um, I don't know how, right? And uh, I know we want to, so we all agree that we need to do that, but I really don't know how. So I'm very open to, I hope that the engineers and the, uh, the philosophers and uh, the educa uh, educators and uh, business people, we can all work together and uh, to, to make this happen, to, to, to have better um, ethical governance of technology. Thank you. Effie, what's your prediction? I'll come back to what I said earlier. Ethics is work in progress, and so we will keep working on it. Uh, if I look at my field, it took a long time to get to certain standards. I think the opportunity now is in the process of defining what it is to also include process, processes that they're quicker to set in place governance mechanisms. And I think these are things we can set up fairly quickly. So I don't want to, I want to look at the next decade and, and see implementation of certain processes that allow us to implement some of what we have already decided is a good thing and also allow us the flexibility to revise those norms as we go along. Great. Tim. Um, short term, I think we're going to continue to see a polarized discourse. The Terminator movies are going to drive the AI debate more so than some of the ethical reflection, unfortunately. Long term, I am optimistic that these kinds of meetings, these kinds of events are going to direct us to uh, a sustainable, um, principled approach to ethics privacy. On this optimistic note, please <laughs> join me in thanking uh, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.